Well, good evening once again, Faith Baptist Church. It's good to be with you once again, and here's our Wednesday night lesson. Uh, I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but I want to just uh, thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for uh, your continued faithfulness to our church during these times. And uh, just to update you a little bit, we're looking, uh, moving closer to being able to meet in person once again, and hopefully a decision will be coming about that here shortly. So just, uh, if you would, take your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 14. Luke, chapter number 14, and we will be spending the majority of our time right here in Luke 14 uh, for our lesson. So uh, who doesn't love a dinner party? You know, a family meal, a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, Christmas time. I mean, some folks just live for parties, live for places where they can gather together and share food and fellowship and and truly, as a church, we also love to get together with our church family and have the fellowship. I don't know about you, but I certainly miss our mealtime on Sundays after the morning service that we gather together as a church family and share lunch. And uh, just uh, those are blessings. And oftentimes we take these things for granted. And we've kind of found out here recently that we shouldn't take anything for granted. That includes church and meeting at church. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, be back together uh, real soon. You know... Some families live for the holidays because they love to get together and have the big family meals and things like that, enjoy a feast. Who would ever pass up an opportunity like that if they had one? Uh, if you had an opportunity to, ascend, uh, you know, to attend to a big dinner or fellowship meal, why in the world would anybody refuse to do that? But in our lesson today, we're going to see that that is exactly what happens here in our text in Luke chapter 14. And our lesson today is entitled, the unpopular party. The unpopular party. Uh, here in our text, we find the parable of the Great Supper. And uh, it falls on the heels of an encounter that Jesus himself had with a particular Pharisee. Jesus was invited to eat at this particular Pharisee's house. And most scholars as, uh, believe, as I do, that this was a setup. In other words, this was just another time when the Pharisees were trying to set up Jesus trying to catch him in a mistake, catch him in a misspeak, uh, and so on and so on. But we know, those of us who know Christ as our Savior, realize that he was the perfect uh, perfect uh, man, sinless in every way, never spoke a word out of, out of turn, never spoke a word out of sort, never got angry to the point where he lost his control. Uh, we, we, uh, we take for granted that we serve a sinless Savior. But they also invited a man to the same meal, who was, uh, uh, had the dropsy. And of course, if you don't know what the dropsy was, it was just simply a condition where the body retained fluid and got very swollen, very unsightly. And this man at the party or the fellowship uh, that was being uh, conducted at this Pharisee's house, the meal, he would have surely stood out amongst the guests. And so Jesus takes notice of him and he asks the Pharisee, if it is lawful to heal on the Sabbath, of course, you know what the Lord was thinking. He says, I'm going to take care of this fellow and get him back up on his feet the way it needs to be. But upon their silence to the question, Jesus goes ahead then and he uses this opportunity to address a, a, a particular sin of pride uh, and how it contrasts with humility. You know, God, I said to you on Sunday that God expects us to live a humble life before our mankind or before our friends and family doesn't want us puffed up, doesn't want us prideful, and uh, how we ought not to assume that just because we're invited, as we'll see here in our text today, just because we're invited, we're not the bell of the ball, and uh, we don't have to have the, uh, the number one place at the table and all those things. Look with me, if you will, at Luke chapter number 14. We're going to look at verse number 8. And the Bible says, when thou art bidden, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, when thou art bidden to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room lest a more honorable man than you, or than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when, the, then when the, he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up hither. Then, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. And then in verse number 11, Jesus issues a warning against this sort of behavior. He says, For whosoever exalt himself shall be abased, 
and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You know, this is a principle that as Christians we ought to take to heart because all too often in our society we have many folks and sometimes sadly even Christians who exalt themselves way more uh, than what they should. You know, Jesus then teaches where our focus should be with regard to reaching uh, folks for Christ. He says, don't always focus on those that we want to be around, but how about focus on those that are needy in our society? And we find that in verse number 12, Luke 14, verse 12, then said he also to him that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brother, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. In other words, what the Lord is saying is, listen, when you're going to have a, a fellowship meal, when you're going to gather with, with people and share a meal, hey, why not invite some folks that are less fortunate? Uh, why not invoke, uh, invite some folks who need some things that you have and things that you can offer? And so there's a spiritual application here, uh, and we need to remember that sometimes we Christians only want to associate with people like ourselves. In other words, people that we like, people that we know, people that we enjoy being around. You know, and, and oftentimes when we get together and we throw a party for those kinds of folks that we know and know us, uh, the only thing that happens is it becomes a competition. Next week you get invited to someone else's house and they try to do you just a little bit more than what you did with them and have a little bit more meal or a little bit fancier surroundings, etc. And so, and so what happens is we're just simply patting each other's ego oftentimes when that happens. But the Lord says, hey, why not look to some folks that are less fortunate? And so when you get ready to have a gathering at your home or at your place where you live, hey, why not reach out and never mind the folks who can do those things on their own, why not invite some folks to this fellowship that can't do things for themselves? Uh, maybe folks that you need to go by and pick up and bring even to the house or, uh, you know, be a blessing. In other words, be a blessing to those that cannot and do not have the ability to do the same things that you do. God never made us rich or never gave us extra in our paycheck each week for us to just continue to heap it on ourselves. No, God gives us extra so that we can be a blessing to those less fortunate. And we need to follow good guidelines and biblical principles when we do that as well. But uh, here's the thing. When we just focus on our friends and our family and our immediate associates in Christianity, that doesn't do a thing for folks who are lost. People who do not know Christ are not going to be benefited when we gather together as Christians and just simply only allow Christians or only invite Christians. Uh, they're not going to, the lost world's not going to benefit from that one bit. Oh, we might have some fun, we might enjoy the meal, but what we need to be focusing on more is bringing those to the, to the fellowships and letting them have a piece of your life, a piece of your heart that are less fortunate, and those who may not even know Christ as your Savior, and use these opportunities to be a blessing and maybe reach some for Christ. Luke chapter 14 and verse 15, we see the, the pious religious person at the fellowship here, and he's, you know, there's one in every crowd. He says, and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Well, well, that sure sounds spiritual, and uh, it probably is true. But, you know, sometimes uh, what people need most of all is they don't need cliches. They don't need, uh, you know, uh, talking points. What they need more is they need the truth, and they need to see a part of you that you don't show oftentimes to other folks, and that is the genuineness that you have care and concern uh, for them. From here, Jesus leads them into the parable of the Great Supper, and that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. This is the mastery of Jesus' teaching style. Uh, he's the greatest teacher that has ever been, uh, greatest preacher who's ever been. But I'll tell you this, he has a teaching style that we preachers, we teachers of the gospel, we church workers, we could learn a whole lot from by just watching what Jesus did in his earthly ministry. And here's a great example. He was using the present circumstances to teach a biblical truth. Hey, what would we do if we would do more of the same thing when we teach? Rather than just, like I said, throwing out cliches and religious speak, hey, why not use the circumstances that you find somebody in to try to reach them for the cause of Christ? 
So when there was a there was a uh, uh, when there was uh, to be a big banquet, the host would often invite people far in advance, and uh, the day uh, was given uh, that there was going to be the feast or the great supper, but the exact time was left open until the host prepared everything and then made the announcement, it is time. So people would often commit to their invitation early on uh, when it was offered, and then on the day the banquet actually took place, uh, the messenger appeared, and that's when the excuses uh, would surely come. You know, I think about this, and I think oftentimes when we hear about people planning big events, and you know, we've planned things at the church on often different days or different times of the year, and Everybody that hears about it says, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Boy, that's going to be good. I'm going to be at that thing. And then when the day comes for the event to take place, we often find a lot of folks just simply make excuses uh, to not do what they said they were going to do. In other words, their word really isn't good as it was when they heard about the event. You know, some people would commit to the invitation. And in this day, obviously, people did commit. In verse number uh, 16, the Bible says, Then said he unto them, A certain man... This is Jesus speaking, made a great supper and bade many. What does that mean? It means it was well known. People heard about it. He made it known around in the area where he was. And a lot of folks were going to be invited to this uh, big great supper. Did you know in America, according to a recent study, the most common excuse given for not fulfilling our commitments, the number one excuse, if you take all the excuses and you combine them and you rank them in the, no, in the order of precedent, the number one excuse that we hear most in America is this. I'm just too tired. I just don't have the energy, the strength to do it. That's the number one excuse. The number two excuse is this. I can't afford it. I just can't afford it. And then three days later, you go out and you buy a new car. I'm telling you folks, excuses abound in America and certainly excuses abound in society today. The third one is, I just don't have time. I'd love to serve in that ministry, Pastor, but I just don't have any time. And then on Facebook, the very next day, you see them out on a hiking trip in the mountains or you see them fishing or you see them playing tennis or you see them. The truth of the matter is we have time to do whatever we choose to do for the most part. If we were to take the time of the week that's provided to us, God provides each of us, we would have plenty of time if we would just use it a little bit more wisely. America's favorite excuses, I'm too tired, I can't afford it, and I just don't have the time. I hope that's not your excuse today, Christian. If you're being asked to do something for the Lord, I hope you're not going to throw one of those excuses his way because let me just say this to you, he knows your heart. He knows exactly whether or not you're telling the truth, and that is true. And we're going to see today with our excuses in this day, these excuses really didn't hold the water that they were being used to, to float with. In this day, it was considered an insult to the host. If you had accepted an invitation to this great supper, and then later on you decided, well, I'm not going to go for whatever reason, it was a breach of etiquette. It was something that was taken very seriously. As a matter of fact, if you were invited and didn't show up and gave a, 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 a flimsy excuse, uh, that, would, that would eliminate you from further consideration in the future. If you eliminated or, or if you uh, 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 refused an invitation and decided not to come in the very beginning, no problem. But if you accepted the invitation and then later on you said, nah, I just don't feel like going, you would be eliminated. From consideration from that confirmed commitment. Of course, in this day, a person's commitment meant a whole lot more than it does today. Today, people just change their mind. They change their word. Uh, their word is not like it once was, and that's really kind of a shame. And, and truthfully, at church, that ought not to be the way it is. If you tell someone that you're going to do something, we ought to do our very best to fulfill our commitment just like we said we would. Oh, today, would marriages be so much sweeter if husbands and wives would just Remember the vows that they took at the wedding altar and live those vows in honesty and decency before each other and before God. In this parable, Jesus was teaching us several, uh, several uh, important truths. You know, as a side note, this passage of Scripture also, theologically, this parable also shows the fact of the Jews' rejection of their Messiah. When the Lord Jesus came on the scene, he was the Messiah. And the Jews wholly pretty much rejected him except for a few. 
and God turning then to the Gentiles, and he has ta taken his focus and placed it now on the Gentiles to carry out the mission that he once intended for the Jews. That's a side note, a, day, a, a discussion for a different day. But, you know, I realize with excuses, there are certain things that come up that are beyond our control. But what we are talking about here is not that. Let's analyze these excuses that are given in our text. Let's go back to the text, Luke 14. Look, look with me, if you will, at verse 17. The Bible, we'll, we'll start in verse 16. Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. So there it is. The invitation has been given. The reminder has been sent. And look what happens in verse 18. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So you see the excuses. There's three excuses given uh, that these uh, folks who were invited to this uh, the great supper gave to the host uh, as to why they were not going to show up. Have you ever accepted an invitation to something in advance and then the day comes and it's time to show up at the event and you just decide, you know what, I just don't really want to go to that after all. You know, when we do that, what we're doing is we're basically saying to someone, you're really not as important to me as I led you to believe in the beginning. Now, keep in mind, I remember, certain things happen, we, under, we understand that. But generally speaking, most times, often, when we make an excuse not to do something, it's just really because, let's just be honest, we just really don't want to do it. And that's sad, because what we're saying to that person is, you were important enough to me in the beginning when I accepted the invitation, but you're not important enough to me now to do what I said I would do. So here at this stage... A certain man had made this great supper. He sent out his, his uh, messenger, and he's gone out and he's bade many. That means there was a lot of people invited. Christians here can, can see clearly that Jesus, Jesus has made all things ready for us, by the way. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus has made all things ready for all mankind. And now all that a man has to do is he has to come to the cross of Calvary, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, and he can also dine at God's table. But you know what happens? The problem is with mankind today, they're full of foolish excuses. Foolish excuses not to accept the greatest invitation that's ever been, to, great, uh, to dine at the greatest table that's ever been. And that's, by the way, God's table. In verse number 17, we see that he sent out the messenger and, and, uh, and all things are ready. And so God has made a way for man to receive Christ. I just said that a minute ago, but... To have a place at God's table, you have to be a child of God. So in our text, the stage is set. All things are now ready. But notice, as we read those verses, verses 18 through 20, the excuses begin to come. You know, excuses are often fashioned for convenience. I mean, let's just be honest. Oftentimes, we make excuses because it's just better and more convenient for us that we do that instead of just following through on the commitment that we made. And I tell you today, that is just so, uh, it's, a, it's a shame to have that be our mindset and to be that our mode of operation. We ought to realize when we make a commitment to someone, we ought to just honor it and do what we said we would do. And then trust God to give us the strength and all the other things that we need in the process, keeping our word. You know, excuses are awful, all, also often clung to in desperation. You know, the great preacher Spurgeon said this, he said, hope does not begin until excuses end. What a great quote. Uh, hope does not begin until excuses end. You know, that's true today so much for our Christian life. Uh, Christians, hey, listen, we would be so much better off if we would just simply stop making excuses for the things that we should be doing that we're not doing. And stop making excuses instead of just, let's just get done what we know we're supposed to be doing our lives would be so much better off. Our lives would be so much more fruitful. And I'm just telling you, God wants that from us more than anything in the world. Look at foolish excuse number one. He says this, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. Think about this with me for a second. 
Well, let's take the second excuse as well because they kind of relate. The second man says, I have bought five yoke of oxen and go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Did you notice in both excuses at the end of it, they say, I pray thee, have me excused? You know, that is all sounding so spiritual. Uh, these two folks were sounding so spiritual about their denial of their keeping their word and all those things. But did you notice in both of these cases, their ability to come and be faithful to their word and honor the invitation that they were given, both have come down to this. They would rather be involved with material things than just rather be keeping their word to the person that they had given it to. The first person says, I bought a piece of ground. Who in their right mind buys a piece of real estate and then says, that I, now i got to go see it? It just doesn't make any sense. And we can probably honestly write this one off as just a big stretch of the truth. The second one, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excuse. Who in the right mind would buy a yoke of oxen and then prove them? I'm pretty confident that most of us, if we were in the position and we were farmers and we were depending on oxen as it was in this day in order to do the things that we needed to support our livelihood and our family with our food and all those kinds of things, we sure wouldn't buy oxen and then prove them. We would be proving them before we bought them. So this excuse also does not hold water. But who in their right mind would make these kinds of excuses unless they were just grasping at something and trying to get themselves, in other words, a convenient way to get out of their commitment? Who in their right mind buys something important and then says, well, I've got to check it out after I buy it? This doesn't work. The excuses begin to explain why such a wonderful, grand opportunity was now being rejected. I can't see any reason why these excuses would be reason to reject this grand opportunity to come and dine at the master's table. We can see clearly that both excuses given were made for foolish reasons on foolish premises. And it just doesn't make any sense. You know, if we as Christians truly believe Christianity is such a great opportunity and wonderful opportunity, and it merits everyone's attention that we come in contact with, why are not more people in the church house? Why every Sunday morning when we open the church doors under normal circumstances, do we still have plenty of extra seats? If Christianity is such a great opportunity, why do we have so many open spots in our church houses? As a matter of fact, why are so many people, especially in the young community, leaving the church if Christianity is all that it's cracked up to be? Excuses as to why we don't share our faith. Why do we make excuses? Could it be, could it be that our excuse-making has become more important than our doing? In other words, are we making excuses rather than just simply doing what we need to do? Uh, do we have reason to be excited for the opportunity to dine at the master's table like we see here in our text? Uh, has God given us reason to be grateful? Uh, has God given us reason to rejoice and tell everyone we know about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? With the first two excuses, we see that in both cases, the respective commitments were not to be honored and the excuse resolved around, or revolved around material things. Plain and simple. Things became more important than commitment. Material things are here today and gone tomorrow. So many things over history, if we look back since we were growing up as a child and we remember all of the things that just sort of came along, they were going to be the, 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 uh, the be-all to end-all. And what happens? They just slowly fade off of the scene, never to be heard about again. You know, how many folks do you remember when you were growing up? I remember when Alyssa, my daughter, was growing up, the American Girl doll was the must-have for all young girls around the six or seven year old range. Every young girl in America wanted an American Girl doll. It was just the thing. I don't even know where that doll is today for my daughter. Maybe she does. I don't. I don't think she is really too tuned into it now. But at that time, it was going to be the thing that was going to be worth millions of dollars at some point in the future. And all these, all these stories that you hear about things. Now I don't even know haven't heard anybody talk about that in years and years. 
but it was a must-have at that point. In our story, the preoccupation with things, in the first man's case, the real estate, the second man's case, the oxen, deep down, I really don't think that was the reason that either of those men did not honor their commitment. I think it really just boiled down to that the fact that they just really didn't want to. They just didn't really want to be at this feast. They didn't want it for whatever reason, and they just made excuses as to why they weren't there. You know, sadly, far too many Christians... Far too many Christians are also taken by things. Excuse number three, if you look in our text, verse number 20, another said, I have married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Now he's a little bit different. His excuse is also foolish because if he had wanted to come to the, uh, the supper, the host would have gladly welcomed him and his wife, no problem whatsoever. That was just the way things were done then. But how many family members will be lost? How many family members will be lost and they will go out into an eternity lost forever, separated God with, uh, from God for all eternity because we have just made excuses rather than really got busy and started loving these folks like we should, sharing with them, challenging them on the gospel. Uh, and I don't mean in a mean-spirited way, but I'm just saying use every opportunity that God gives to make sure that they know Christ and the benefits of the Christian life. You know, several months ago, I was preaching a service here at the church, and I asked Christians this question. Why are we Christians? Why have I chosen to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in my life? Why Christianity? Why would I become a Christian? You know, that's a very important question. I hope you've come to a good understanding of what your answer is, and that you're ready to give an answer to them who ask for the hope that lies within you. You know, we should be able to answer that question but I'll just say this, how many family members will be lost and they will spend an eternity in hell because we've made excuses not to invite them to the banquet or to the great supper? This man and his wife would have been more than welcome at this banquet had they just came and honored their word. When we allow family, by the way, family to come, family is, is an issue sometimes for Christians because sometimes we allow family to hinder us from doing what we know we need to do. Sometimes it's in the form of we just we don't want to talk to them about God because we don't want to start any arguments. Uh, sometimes we miss church because family shows up unexpectedly and they're not churchgoers. And we say, well, we can't just very well leave these people here in our house without us being here. We, we, you know, we, can, just, we can avoid and miss church today. Can I tell you this? Whenever we do that, we hinder those same folks from being saved because what we're saying to them is this. They're more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the problem to begin with. People today who are unsaved, who want nothing to do with Christ, have made a conscious or unconscious decision in their mind to say this, hey, I'm more important than anything. It's all about me. Uh, I want to have things my way. This Christ person, I don't need him because I'm doing just fine on my own. I don't want to be uh, yoked down to some religion. And, and every time we as Christians, we allow family and friends to prevent us from doing the things of God that we should do, we're in fact saying to those folks, they're more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a shame. The best thing we can do for our families is show them this. Hey, nothing is going to come between me and my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That includes family gatherings on Sundays that uh, we, uh, we have to be at instead of being at church. It includes times where church uh, activities are going on and we opt to go with family instead. And all those, I'm not saying that you have to be at the church every time there's a function. But I am saying this, God has to have first place in your life if you're going to experience the blessings that he has prepared for you. Hey, it's no, it, spiritual, our spiritual life takes work, and we've got to be committed, and we've got to do the things that God wants us to do if we're going to see the fruit that God wants us to have. All three of these excuse makers were simply hiding the fact that they simply did not want to attend this man's great supper you know behind all excuses is a lack of desire that's really what it boils down to excuses come when there's a when there's a lack of desire and in our particular case in our text today excuses will oftentimes suffice for our friends in other words we can make excuses to our friends and family and oftentimes they'll just let us off the hook with an excuse why because they make excuses themselves but can i tell you 
Whenever we make excuses with God, we're not fooling him. It won't work with God. Uh, we can't make a, a, a flimsy excuse and expect God's going to say, oh, okay, well, that's fine. You just go ahead and do your own thing, and I'll still bless you anyway. It, Christian, listen to me. It doesn't work that way. God blesses because of obedience. Simple obedience. In other words, simply do what God asks to do, and the Bible says you'll be blessed. Notice excuse number three. He also made the statement at the end of his excuse. He said, I cannot come. Never let your wife or a family member be your excuse not to do what God wants you to do. Not only did this third man make excuse, he goes as far as saying, I cannot come. And it's almost as if he's saying, discussion over. No discussion necessary. I'm just not coming. Verse 21, the Bible says, So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house became angry and said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Notice the response of the host. He was angry, and for good reason, because he had spent much time preparing for the things that were happening at this great supper. He had the meat and the, all of the, 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 uh, the provisions were made ready. The, the meal was cooked. And all he needed now was the seats at the table to be full. If those that were invited weren't going to come, what did he say? He said, well, go back and ask them again. Go back and plead with them. Go back and make extra, you know, make extra provisions. For he didn't say any of that. He just said this, never mind them. Go and find some others. And that's a great lesson to us as Christians. How many times have we tried to put a cherry on top of the gospel? <laughs> Foolishly. The gospel doesn't need a cherry on the top for people to take it. The gospel stands on its own. If the gospel is delivered properly in love and understanding and, and humility, we don't need to put a cherry on the top. Nobody needs to take up for Christ. Christ has done it all himself. And all we have to do as Christians is just look at this and say, look, this is the gospel, plain, pure, and simple. You either have it or you don't. Jesus clearly teaches us here in this parable that it's not necessary to put a cherry on the gospel. Doesn't, man doesn't need to add anything to the gospel. It stands on its own. And so the host of the party here says, look it, go out and find some new folks. We're going to have this party one way or the other. We're going to have it. Everything's ready. All we need is people at the table. And he sends his servants out to find more. And you know, the truth is God has made a way for all men to experience a life of great reward and fruitfulness. But sadly, many will miss out because of the things we've already seen, because they simply make excuse. Don't be an excuse maker. Do what you say you'll do. Honor God with your word. As a Christian, we ought to have the, the mindset that every time we give somebody our word, we're going to do our level best to fulfill what we have said. Verse number 22 of our text says this, And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and there is yet room. So he goes out and he tells them to go out and find, uh, find more and fill the table. The servant goes out and he invites the, the lame and the maimed and the halt and the blind, and there's still room at the table. And in this day, it was a custom that if there were still seats at the table, that the banquet was not full, they needed to be inviting more folks. So he tells them in verse number 22, after the servant tells him that there's still room at the table, number, verse number 23, the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges. And then he makes this statement, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Because there were seats at the table doesn't mean the party was going to be canceled. The event was still going to take place no matter who attended. You know, the world today has done its best to make the cause of Christ of none effect. You know, during this current pandemic, there are folks out there that if you were to ask them about the church and the importance of the church, whether it's essential or not essential, they would have to say, well, geez, you know, I really don't know because I haven't been at the church house in 
5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years even. And then they don't understand why their lives are in such disarray and dysfunction. The church house has been made of none effect by many in government today. That's why so many lawsuits are going on across the country because governors and mayors and all these other folks have decided that they have an important role to play in shutting the church down. Not because they want to shut the church down for the sake of shutting it down, but because they think that their power goes beyond what it actually does. Church is protected by the Constitution. Very clearly written, and most federal authorities have agreed with churches during this current time that the church has a right to be open and a right to be functioning as normal. But you know, the Lord will not cancel the future because folks have made the church of none effect. Because the governors have closed the churches and tried to stop people from worshiping the way that they've been doing for the last however many hundreds of years, that doesn't mean that the church is of none effect. It doesn't mean that the future that we know that the Bible holds for all mankind will not go on as planned. It will. It doesn't matter if anybody believes it or not. The Bible is clear that the future will come regardless of how many people are looking to it and abiding by it. Why would so many make excuse not to attend this great supper? Why would this unpopular why would this party be so unpopular all of a sudden? Luke chapter 14 and verse 24 says this, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. That's a sad verse. That's a sad verse because what is it saying? It's saying that those that were, were asked to come and said they would come have now decided not to come. And every time we make a commitment to someone or something, and we fail to honor our commitment and make excuses instead, there's a cost. Hey, I grew up for 30 years not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. What was the cost for growing up 30 years without Christ? What was the cost? What did it cost me to live for 30 years unsaved? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It almost cost me my home and my marriage. Uh, let me just say this also. The, ca the cost is not yet known and may never be known in this lifetime. But I'll tell you this, after being saved and becoming a Christian, my life changed for the good and it's continued to get better and better and better. God's blessings overflow. And the saddest part is sometimes Christians, we think that God blesses us because we deserve it. <laughs> and the truth is, that's just not the truth. God blesses us because he's a God of love. He's a God of, of grace and mercy and all those things. And, and so when we ask ourselves, what is the reason why so many folks would, 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 would reject an opportunity to sit at God's table and dine? The Bible says in verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So in conclusion, let me just say this. What do we learn from this passage of Scripture that we've been looking at today? First of all, excuses are a part of man's fabric. Excuses are something that we learn. It's a learned, it's a learned activity. We learn it from watching others. But can I tell you, most often excuses are just that. They're just simply excuses for not doing what we should be doing. Then number two, in regard to inviting people to dine at God's table, we should expect excuses. How many times have you gone out and tried to invite somebody to church and invite somebody to a church function and they say, eh, you know, no, that's just not for me. And then we just leave it right there, never invite them again, just write them off and never pray for them, never ask them. And we even stop asking others because that one person made an excuse not to do and accept the invitation that we make. Don't let that happen. Christians, listen to me. We need to be persistent. We need to be persistent, but we need to be humble. We need to be persistent, but we need to be truthful. And we need to remember that when we bring the gospel to somebody who's lost, we're just simply bringing them the good news that we were given, uh, that was brought to us at one point that we were given. Don't get all prideful and make yourself out like you're some big thing. Just simply give them the truth of the gospel 
and let the Spirit of God take care of the rest. And then number three, don't allow excuses to hinder your evangelism. Stop trying to make the gospel more palatable for folks than it already is. I can't think of anything more palatable than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we get from the gospel? We get to spend all eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to spend the, the, the rest of our, uh, our being for all eternity, forever and ever and ever in the presence of God. Why would it require anything for us to add? What could we possibly add to that that would make that better? I can't think of anything. You know, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ stands on its own merit. Just tell men about Jesus and leave the rest to God. And I believe if we'll do that and we'll quit with the excuses, we'll accept the invitations that God gives us to do the things he wants us to do. And if we'll do those things, I believe, because the Bible promises that we'll be better off for it. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday, Lord willing. And uh, we're going to go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for our time together today. Add your blessing to your word as it's gone forth. And Father, we'll be careful to thank you for all that you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you and have a good day. And if we can be a help to you at Faith Baptist Church, please reach out to us. You can email us at faithbaptistvt org and we'd be happy to help you if we can have a good day thank you